right, folks, we're going to get started with or without the rest of the game. Um, uh, first thing I'd like to talk about today um, is ethics. Um, I know that you know that the name of our course is Real Estate Law and Ethics. Uh, we haven't talked directly about ethics at any great length. We're going to do that for just a couple of minutes. Um, we have discussed from time to time uh, issues that come up in the textbook, particularly in that changing landscape section about green development and stewardship of the environment and ethics regarding vacant lands and, and, and all that stuff's real important and I'm glad that we've talked about it. Um, and that certainly is an important part of ethics and your ethical obligation as a real estate developer. Um, our syllabus, which I didn't write, uh, says we're also going to focus on ethics as a branch of philosophy applied to business ethics, whatever that means, and that we're going to study models of ethical theories of practical use to a business person. And I have even less idea what that means. Um, But I'd like to talk to you for a minute about what ethics means to me um, in your practice as a real estate developer. Um, and it's as simple as the almost trite things you've been hearing since you were a kid from your parents of, uh, of do the right thing and what goes around comes around. Um, but I'd like to talk to you about applying that to your practice as a real estate developer um, and in the context of a real estate deal. Um, there are two reasons um, that, that you want to treat people as you'd want them to treat you in a deal. Um, not only that it's the right thing to do, but, but the fact that you're going to get a lot of benefits from that later both now in the present deal and in future deal. Um, you got to make people want to do business with you. And the way you make them do that is to make them feel comfortable because they feel like they can trust you in a deal. Um, a handshake and your word um, go an awful long ways. Um, we, of course, as lawyers, are, are big on telling everybody to get everything in writing, get an enforceable agreement so you can sue somebody if they renege. Um, but good people don't need that. Um, your reputation is something you can't buy. Um, it can take you years to build it up. And you can blow it in one deal by trying to take advantage of somebody. Um, I'd like to tell you a story of a very successful real estate development firm out of Coral Gables uh, back in the 70s. Um, the firm was doing great deals and was buying buildings everywhere, uh, doing condo conversions, uh, buying office buildings and refurbishing them and retenanting re them. Um, and everybody wanted to do a deal with these folks. Um, but then they start getting real aggressive. And they hired a good Miami law firm, and they communicated to the law firm that, that the development firm wanted to have a reputation of being tough guys. And that they could, uh, they would argue points far beyond where it was justified. And their lawyers made it clear that if you crossed them, their litigation department would sue you. Um, interestingly, the banks doing deals with them in Miami found that on virtually every loan commitment, every signed up loan commitment, the bank got sued for one reason or another. Um, and the bank's lawyers didn't like working with the lawyers for this firm um, because every matter they tried to agree upon, they encountered threats of a lawsuit. 
Um, the firm was really just trying to, to give itself an image of being uh, tough and aggressive. But here's what happened. Um, banks started turning them down on deals. Um, and in those days, banks, boards were controlled by law firms whose lawyers served on those boards. And the lawyers didn't want to deal with them. And they didn't like dealing with their aggressive lawyers. And interestingly, because they were trying to play tough guy, um, and, and they actually were doing quality deals, um, people wouldn't deal with them because they felt like every move they made, they were going to get sued. And, and that, to me, was an example of, of uh, somebody who wasn't doing the right thing and wasn't putting people at ease and making them comfortable because they felt like they had to dot every T, dot every I, cross every T, or they would get sued. Um, that's not who you want to be. You want to be the person who sits down with somebody on the other side of the table and makes them immediately feel comfortable, feel like you can be trusted, like you're trying to help them in a deal, um, and not trying to jam them up. Um, you hear some developers who, at every opportunity to better themselves in a deal, say, let's jam up the other side. Let's hurt them. Let's do whatever we can to, to get ahead in this deal. And that may work well for them in that one deal. But the word spreads quickly and people won't deal with them anymore. Um, I'd like to give you another example of, of <coughs> just the type of thing that, in my opinion, you don't want to do. Um, we talked about the statute of frauds and its different requirements and what it requires in a deal. Uh, and as you will recall, one of the things the statute of frauds required was that in a lease, uh, if the lease is over a year, of course it has to be in writing, but that there are required to be two witnesses. Um, most people don't know that. Most people don't do that. And what I'm saying to you in, in terms of wanting you, wanting you to learn to follow that requirement of making sure there are two witnesses is to make sure that that somebody can't get out of a deal on you. You make sure that there are two witnesses on the, are on the lease so that your leases will be enforceable and that so nobody can pull on you saying we're not going forward with this deal because it doesn't have two witnesses. What I'm getting at is you don't want to be the person on the other side. You don't want to be the person that uses that as a sword. If you shook hands with somebody and you made a deal, and you wrote it up and you forgot to get witnesses on the lease, well, don't use it as an excuse to get out of the damn deal. Uh, you've given your word. Um, you've signed up a document. You meant it. You're not looking for, don't be looking for a back door. Don't be looking to be cute because the word will get around and nobody will do a deal with you. Um, so basically, I just want to communicate to you that, that conducting yourself ethically and treating people the way that you'd want to be treated will let you do more deals, will let you do better deals. It'll make brokers bring deals to you because they know you're going to act properly. You're not going to embarrass them. Um, and um, it'll it'll improve whatever type of practice you have um, by building a reputation that people can trust you and make people want to deal with you. So that's the end of my speech on, on ethics and, and in my mind your need to conduct yourself in a way um, that makes people want to bring deals to you because they want to do deals with you um, as opposed to hoping not to have to do a transaction with you because you try to be cute, you try to be clever, and you try to jam somebody. It doesn't work. It may work in one deal, um, but there won't be many more for you. Um, so that's the end of my little speech on ethics. Um, what I'd like us to do now is to go back and finish the chapter on mortgages. Uh, we 
we dealt with the last section, and we, we teed it up a little bit, and I want to go back there again. Um, we teed up what the text talks about as sale of mortgage real estate, but to me it's, it's the transfers on both sides of that coin, both the transferring of the mortgage and the transferring of the land uh, that has an existing mortgage on it. Let's talk again about a piece of property that's owned by the owner, who of course is the borrower in our situation. And the borrower is going to go out to a bank. Bank number one is going to get a mortgage with a 10-year term and an attractive interest rate. And let's talk about what happens during the life of that mortgage, both on this end of it, on the mortgagee end of it, which is the lender side, and on the mortgagor, which is the owner borrower side. Um, we talked about for a minute to realize that both of these interests, the lien interest of the mortgage and the ownership interest of the property, are very transferable, as we know they are, but transferable during the life of this mortgage. Um, at any point during this mortgage, Bank One could do an assignment of mortgage, that's the document which is done, to assign the mortgage to Bank Two. Who could assign the mortgage to Bank Three? When it, the time comes for that mortgage to mature, and you need a document to show that the loan has been paid off, you want to be careful not to automatically think that you're going to go back to bank one to whom you gave the mortgage. You may not even know that a mortgage has been transferred two or three times. If bank one makes the mortgage to you and retains the servicing, you may for 10 years make your payments to bank one. But that doesn't mean that at the end of the loan that that's who owns the mortgage. If the mor you'll need to do a title search is my point and see if the mortgage has been transferred and see if in fact the person that you make your last payment to when you're looking to get that mortgage is in fact the record owner of the mortgage. Because you may need a satisfaction of mortgage from bank three or from bank two even though you dealt with bank one all through the term of the loan. So understand that the mortgagee side of a mortgage can be transferred from bank to bank to bank. Uh, somebody made an excellent point last time about could a purchase money mortgage be transferred? Sure. Any type of mortgage can be transferred. Um, a purchase money mortgage, a uh, construction mortgage, any type of mortgage can be transferred. Um, in the purchase money mortgage situation, um, let me give you a tip. If you're a seller, remember a purchase money mortgage is what a seller accepts back when the seller is going to hold the paper. Uh, if you think you might want to sell that mortgage, think about it before the mortgage is closed. And here's why. If you, as a seller, execute a sales contract and you know you're going to be taking back a purchase money mortgage and you know you're going to want to liquidate that quickly, that you're not going to want to hold that mortgage for 10 years. They're going to want to get rid of it. You're going to want to sell it. Go ahead and consult a mortgage broker about does he have any clients who are mortgage investors who might be wanting to purchase your mortgage. And my point is do that before you close the mortgage loan as a part of the sale and find out what forms might be required. Um, I know you know that in residential mortgage transactions we have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Loans are transferred immediately after closing to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac who buy these loans and they buy them by assignment. But they have required forms that they require everybody to use and that's why you see the standard Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac residential mortgage in all these transactions because that's the form that Freddie Mac or Fannie requires in order to purchase the loan. My point is, if you're a private lender, if you're a seller and you're going to be selling to private investors, you may find that they have forms 
that they want used. And you can get those forms and use those forms <coughs> in your transaction so it will become saleable to that investor because an investor, you, you won't get to go back to your buyer or borrower and say, gee, could we sign up different forms later now that I want to sell it? You get one kiss at the pig. So find out in advance if you have a purchase money mortgage that you're going to want to sell and be able to assign either to a bank or to an investor and find out what their requirements are and what their forms are and try to close your loan in that fashion and it'll be more saleable. Um, so understand that during the term of a loan it can be transferred, but that's kind of a given and I think most people knew that. What I really want us to focus on is during the 10 year term of the loan, the transferability of the piece of property where this owner becomes a seller and wants to sell to a buyer and sell the property, let's say at year three, of a 10-year term mortgage. And maybe that rate is very attractive. Maybe three years later, rates have now gone up to 6%. So it's a very attractive part of your property to be able to transfer it with a mortgage on there at only 4%. So what can, what can a seller do in terms of transferring his property during the life of the loan without paying the loan off. It's easy to pay the loan off, that's a no brainer If the buyer goes and gets if the buyer goes and gets a new <coughs> loan, well of course your loan gets paid off. But what we're talking about here is a way the seller can sell and have this mortgage still be on there. And are there ways to structure a deal uh, keeping that mortgage alive and not paying it off? Now what we need to be aware of, first of all though, is that every mortgage nowadays contains a due on sale clause. It used to be that we, did, we used to only have them in commercial loans and residential loans were totally transferable. Um, and for years in Florida, a due on sale clause was not enforceable. A due on sale clause, of course, is a simply a clause that says if the borrower sells the property, the loan is due. It's, it's due on sale. The loan becomes due upon the sale of the property. It's a very important clause. It's in every mortgage today. Um, the point is, and, and it is totally enforceable, the courts in every state now say that due on sale clauses are enforceable. They didn't used to, uh, but now all the states have come around and said the due on sale clause works. But like we talked about on the prohibition of assignment of leases and stuff, but that doesn't mean that people don't do it anyway. Um, and part of the reason is that lenders don't always find out about it. So if the lender is not aware that the property has been transferred, then of course the lender can't and won't call the loan. As long as the loan is current and they're still getting their payments, pretty much lenders are asleep. They're getting what they want, they're getting their payment every month. Um, so people know that, and people do, notwithstanding the fact that there's a due on sale clause in the mortgage, the mortgage has a due on sale clause in it, notwithstanding that, they do transfer title of the property. So let's talk about the three different things that can happen to that mortgage and the treatment of that mortgage in conjunction with the sale of this piece of property to a borrower, to a buyer by the borrower to a buyer, and again to another buyer. It can happen again and again during that 10 years. There are three different things that can happen to that loan. The first thing is called an assumption. That's where the buyer agrees with the seller basically to take over the payments. Buyer starts making the payments. Buyer then starts making the payments to whichever bank holds the mortgage. And you know, a few days before the closing, the seller makes the payment. And the next month, the buyer makes the payment. Um, in an assumption, the seller remains liable. 
Remember, the seller is the one who signed the note and mortgage to the bank. And the seller does not get released if the bank calls the loan under the due on sale clause. The bank then can sue both the seller and the buyer. An assumption is an agreement then where the buyer agrees in favor of the seller that the buyer will keep making the payments. But the holder of the loan, the bank, still holds the seller life. Now, sometimes there are assumptions, and, and, and the terms don't change. So therefore, the buyer is getting to take over a 4% loan. That's attractive. That helps you sell your property. If rates today are six, and you can sell, uh, sell your property with a loan already in place on there at four, then that's beneficial to help you sell your piece of property. So one of the ways you can handle that loan is an assumption, which is called buyer assumes and agrees to pay. Buyer assumes and agrees to pay the mortgage and take over the payments, but seller remains liable. Sometimes people consult the bank, and sometimes the bank will give you forms that actually allow that to happen. Most of the time, they don't talk to the bank. Most of the time, they just go ahead and do this deal. They get a statement from the bank how much is due. But basically, most often, this is done outside the, um, without the involvement of the bank. Um, some big commercial loans are now providing that they can have a one-time assumption, which is permitted. Big commercial mortgages now have prepayment prohibitions that say that during the 10-year loan, the loan can't be paid off at all. It can't be paid off. So there is a built-in one-time assumption where the lender will actually agree that the buyer may take over the loan, the seller remains liable, but the terms stay the same. So the terms are the same during an assumption, meaning the 4%. The second type of transaction is called a novation. In a novation, you do notify the bank. And the bank agrees that the buyer becomes liable and the seller is released. In a novation, the bank substitutes a new debt. This mortgage stays there, but normally the terms are going to be different. And what in a novation, what happens is the bank, the same existing bank, approves the buyer and makes the buyer liable. And since the bank has approved the buyer's credit and is willing to look to that buyer, the seller is going to be released. So, of course, the bank's going to take a good hard look at the buyer, financial situation, operational abilities to make sure that they do want to release the seller. And normally, normally the terms will change. The bank, in this situation, we said here at year three, the bank would probably like the loan to go to six. The parties may say, well, we're not willing, bank, to have you increase it to six, but we're willing to let you increase it to five. So often, you get kind of a blended rate here, where the bank is happy that the rate has gone up from four to five. Five is still a little under the market at six, so the tr transaction can be an attractive thing for everybody here. The bank gets a little bit of an increase. The buyer gets a rate that's a little bit less than market, and the seller loves it because the seller gets released. So that's the second type of way to transfer title, keeping the existing mortgage on there is called an ovation. Now the third one, and this is rarely done, but this is called subject to. Simply if you do a transaction 
and the buyer says, I'm taking subject to the mortgage, basically there is no agreement whatsoever made regarding the mortgage. The buyer can do whatever he wants to do. The buyer can pay it off, the buyer can make payments, but the seller remains liable. The buyer does not become liable because the buyer has not agreed at all with anything in favor of the lender. Basically, the guys who are willing to buy subject to are people who have money in their pocket, and if a lender calls a loan, they can pay it off, or they know they can go get another loan. These, though, are the three types of ways that title to a piece of property can be transferred. This mortgage can be kept alive. Now. There's one other that's not discussed in this section of your text, and I wouldn't bring this up except that I think it was Dan Lowe that brought this up before, and I skipped this when we talked about the types of mortgages. There's one other thing called a wraparound mortgage. Now, a wraparound is kind of unduly complicated, and wraparound mortgages were designed in the days when due on sale clauses first became enforceable and when banks were regularly checking the titles to their properties to see whether people had transferred loans so that transferred properties so they could call them under a due on sale clause. Um, and the reason they're designed was twofold. Number one, it was to keep the same person, the borrower here, who was the seller making the payments to the bank so the bank stays asleep and doesn't realize the title has been transferred by getting a check from a new guy, as it would in an assumption or as it would in a subject two. They get a check from somebody new, maybe they wake them up to say, hey, maybe we better take a look, it looks like title has been transferred. In a wraparound mortgage situation, what happens is the buyer gives a purchase money mortgage back to the seller, usually for a little bit bigger than this balance. Let's say we had a $500,000 sale and there was a $300,000 existing mortgage. The buyer would give a wraparound $400,000 mortgage back to the seller that includes this $300,000. So basically, in, the, in a transaction like this, the buyer would pay $100,000 cash and would execute a $400,000 wraparound second mortgage. The first mortgage stays on there. The buyer executes a $400,000 wraparound mortgage back to the seller. The seller collects the payments on the $400,000 and monthly makes the payments on the first mortgage. That way the bank gets its payments from the same guy. Normally, there's a spread in these transactions, and if this were the mortgage we were talking about where the first mortgage was at 4% 4, 4 then often the wraparound second mortgage would be $400,000 perhaps at 5%. The buyer in that situation is still doing well. He's getting a 5% loan and the rates those days are six. The seller is really make, hitting a home run here. The seller on $100,000 here earns 5%. And on $300,000, he earns a spread between the 4% and the 5%. The bank is still just getting the four. The point is, these they're now in disfavor. They were the cool thing to do in the 70s and 80s when due on sale clauses were being aggressively enforced. Um, they're not. They're not popular anymore, um, but they were thought to be a cool way of doing a deal and keeping a mortgage on there, and maybe keeping quiet about it so that the bank wouldn't find out. Why did it fall in this favor? I'm sorry? Why did it fall in this favor? Just people just don't do them anymore. Because? Because two or three reasons. Banks are no longer aggressively enforcing their due on sale clauses. Secondly, loans are starting to be done again. Big loans are starting to be done again that have assumption clauses in them okay. for a one-time assumption. Okay. So you don't need to do a deal like right. this. 
where the, the loan can in fact be assumed. Um, and candidly, um, you just don't hear about it much anymore. Uh, maybe, uh, do you in your practice? No, no. Okay. Uh, actually, old timers are most most of the ones that I actually mention. I'm sorry. Old timers. Old timers. Right, right. People that have been real estate for this, years. Yeah, been doing deals that way for years, right. so they still want to do them. Um, the reason the banks get really upset about them is this: banks find out that this seller, who's basically taken back the wraparound mortgage, is earning a one percent spread on their money, and it makes them real unhappy. And when they find that out, they call a loan for sure. Uh, none of this defeats a due on sale clause. All it does, anytime you dot a deed, anytime the original borrower does a deed to a buyer, in any of these forms, you violated the due on sale clause. In this case, of course, if the bank permits the assumption, then the bank has agreed and is not going to enforce the due on sale clause. And in an ovation, they definitely agree because the buyer has applied to them uh, and been approved, and the bank gets a term change. Um, so in those two cases, the due on sale clause, if it's an approved assumption, uh, hasn't really been violated anyway because the bank has been consulted and the bank has consented. Um, in any event. Is the buyer, I'm sorry, is the buyer really protected in a wraparound, for example? Uh, the buyer is making the payments, uh -huh. the seller stops making payments to the bank. Since okay. the bank doesn't know, okay. um, you know, the bank forecloses on the property and he's a second position mortgage, the buyer, that yeah. is. The buyer how, is, how is, that the buyer is not protected in that situation. He's protected dollar-wise because clearly the, borrowers, the buyer's debt of $400,000 is really only a $100,000 debt. But the buyer, if the seller quits making the payments, um, the buyer is going to have to go out and get a new $400,000 mortgage to refinance or else he's going to be facing a foreclosure. Um, clearly, he gets to offset that $300,000 debt against the four hundred dollars due the seller, and only a hundred dollars is due the seller. Uh, but no, it is, it is a scary thing to be making your payments at 5% on $400,000 and keeping your fingers crossed that the guy you're giving them to is paying them uh, paying them to the bank on the first. Understand, though, the situation you're talking about doesn't happen very often because it's in the seller's interest to keep making these payments because if that first loan gets called and goes into foreclosure, this one's going to get wiped out. And we're going to talk about how second mortgages get wiped out in the foreclosure in a few minutes. Um, but the importance is it's in the seller's best interest to keep this mortgage alive not only to earn that 1% spread we talked about here, um, but also because if that first loan gets called, the second loan is in jeopardy too, both as to the property owner and as to the holder of the mortgage. Um, I realize this is all kind of overly complicated, particularly this, which is why I chose initially not to bring it up, but it was asked about. Um, but these three concepts get talked about a lot, and there's something I want you to be familiar with, because people talk about in terms of what they're going to do with that existing loan on the property at the time the deal is done. Are we going to have the buyer assume it? Or are we going to pay it off as easy? That's a no-brainer. If the buyer is going to go out and get a new first mortgage, then clearly this loan is going to get paid off, and we don't have any of this stuff to talk about. But what we're talking about here is how can we keep this loan alive because it was expensive to create the loan. Points are paid, stamps are paid, title exam, attorney's fees. There is a, at least a probably 2% overall cost to creating that loan. And if you pay it off, that cost is just wasted. Thank you. Um, so the ability to do a transaction without doing a whole new loan and having the buyer re-incur the 2% cost of getting a new loan uh, is attractive if there's some ways that you can keep that loan alive. So often as, uh, as you approach a piece of property as a buyer and there's a mortgage on there with a good rate that you'd like to see if there's some way to preserve, these are the kind of thoughts you want to have. Is there any way I can assume that loan and just take that loan over? 
can I maybe apply to the bank for a novation and have them just increase the rate a little bit? In both of those cases, you're avoiding this 2% cost of doing a whole new loan. Or maybe, if it looks like the bank can cooperate, just simply do the deal, worry about it later, um, and either make the payments or don't. Don't make the payments if you're going to apply to refinance anyway at some point down the road, but to go ahead and get the deal closed, not to deal with the lender now and to deal with it simply as a subject two. Subject two is plain old, let's close our eyes and ignore that mortgage and not deal with it at all, but of course deduct its balance. In our deal here where we said it was a $500,000 purchase price and a $300,000 existing mortgage, in all those cases, the buyer is only going to pay $200,000 to the seller. Whether the buyer assumes the mortgage and takes over a $300,000 debt, well, and only $200,000 is due to the seller. Whether there's a novation and the bank changes the terms, you still, as buyer, are taking over $300,000, so you're only going to pay $200,000 to the seller. And likewise, subject to, where you don't deal with the lender at all. You just get a piece of paper that says how much is due, you get a deed from the seller, you give the seller $200,000, and then you take your chances down the road on how you're going to deal with the 300. So, on, okay, on the assumption, the bank knows that someone assumed the loan. The bank knows if you do a permitted assumption. Okay. If you ask the bank and they agree, right. they still don't release the seller, but okay. they agree to let the buyer take it over. What the bank is saying is, we will, on an, in a, an approved assumption, the bank is saying we will not exercise the due on sale clause. We will accept payments from the buyer. But we're not releasing the seller. So how does the seller, for example, let's say that a seller has a shopping center for 10 years, and now they sell it with one of those kings, and it's not an ovation, so he's still liable. Uh -huh. At, how do they structure that? Do they say, well, you know, is the seller always having, I mean, does, do they do it's that? Called, it's called a contingent liability. When you sell a piece of property and the loan is assumed, you as the seller remain liable. And that's called a contingent liability and you have to carry it on your financial statement as a seller as a contingent liability. It is unlikely in an up market that you're ever going to be called upon to pay that debt. Because if the bank forecloses the mortgage, and under our numbers, if the bank forecloses the mortgage and it gets $300,000 for the property, you're not going to have any liability. Right. It's only if there's a shortfall. And they go looking around for somebody to come after it. We're going to talk about that in foreclosures, a deficiency decree. But it's normally they will first go after, for a deficiency, the buyer the owner of the property. And then secondarily, they'll come back and go after the seller. It, but that's only if there's a shortfall. In a rising market where this property, at the time of the loan, let's say at the time that this $300,000 loan was created, uh, the property was worth $400,000. Mm -hmm. And the loan was $300,000. Okay. In a rising market, if three years later the property is worth $500,000, it's all the more likely the bank is going to recover $300,000 when it forecloses, and in which case the seller is really not going to have any liability. Once the bank has been paid in full, that liability is meaningless. Yeah. But you do have to carry it on your financial statement. From a financial disclosure standpoint as a seller, the fact that you are, it's called contingently liable for that debt. If someone assumes the loan, uh -huh. but the bank does not know, can, they, can the bank, if they find out, or will the, well, I guess it can, what would the bank do? If they, they, would, they, would, they would make a demand on both parties. You, you violated my due on sale clause, pay me. Okay. And if they don't, they foreclose the mortgage. Okay. And they sue both parties. And they sue both parties in the foreclosure. So, so, so that assumption, assu so the assumption, if the, seller, if the bank does not know, really becomes uh, a subject to, right? Mm -hmm. No. No? The buyer, has agreed to make the payments in an assumption situation. Okay. And in a subject to, the buyer has not agreed to make the payments. In a subject to, the buyer has simply taken credit for the amount, but he has not agreed to make the payments. That's the difference. 
in in situation one mm -hmm. and situation two, the buyer in both cases has agreed to become liable. And subject to, the buyer has not agreed to become liable. Oh, so the buyer is liable and the seller is liable. Absolutely. In this case, they're both liable. In this case, they're both liable. Right. In, in, in this in case, the seller gets released, case. only the buyer is liable. Okay. And in this case, the seller remains liable. He always was. Of course, he doesn't get off. But the buyer does not assume liability. The buyer does not undertake liability. In so a subject who, to situation. So who would do something like that as subject to? Uh, if I need to close a deal tomorrow and we don't have time to screw with the bank, just close it. Take credit for $300,000 and we'll deal with it later. Who would, who would do it? If the property is worth $500,000, the seller is really not concerned about a $300,000 liability because that property, that property is still there to secure the loan, always. Gotcha. So it's on very, still very unlikely that a seller is going to be called upon. There's going to be that amount of shortfall. We're out of time, folks. We're okay. going to take a break. Let's take our break now until two minutes after two uh, and reconvene then. We can go back to this if we need to. But uh, I want you to have a moment to have a break before. Uh, am I reading that right? I've got the worst reflection on that damn thing. Yeah, yeah. let's come back at two minutes after two, and uh, we'll reconvene on either this or we'll move on to the next chapter, whichever you all want to do. Was that? Yeah. I'm just laying in the bed. 2 a.m.
Okay, folks, we're going to start back. Um, anybody here who hasn't signed this? Okay. Um, are there any further questions on this concept of how do you deal with an existing loan on a piece of property other than paying it off? It's a no-brainer to pay it off. That's easy. But how can we keep the loan alive and still have a sale from a seller who is the borrower to a buyer, or even the next buyer or the next buyer? How can we keep a loan on there um, and not pay it off? Any, any other questions? Okay, let's get chapter 22 out of the way quickly. Uh, we're going to spend an max a half hour on this, hopefully less. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me say one other thing. Unfortunately, I sent you a, a loan document closing checklist. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about it, but it's uh, in a simple commercial loan closing. Uh, borrower's attorney, lender's attorney always creates a checklist of all the things that have to happen before closing, and then the documents at closing. And it's kind of a good outline of all the things that happen in a, in a commercial loan deal. Uh, but again, uh, we're out of time for discussion. But if anybody has any questions on it, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, I'd like to shift to Chapter 22. Uh, and as I mentioned, try to keep it short because these things don't happen very often. But in the spirit of wanting you to understand the vocabulary and, and being able to be conversant in concepts that you're going to hear about, you're going to hear about what the text describes as a land installment contract, what we in Florida call an agreement for deed or a contract for deed. And that's what Chapter 22 is all about. Um, this is another way of financing property without another way of financing property, and it's a way without using a mortgage. Um, we've talked about, obviously, to get, to get financing, buyer can go get a new loan from a new lender, or buyer can give paper back to the seller, or purchase money mortgage back to the seller, uh, which is a method of seller financing. This installment contract, or contract for deed, um, is a method of seller financing that does not involve a bank. It's strictly financing between the buyer and the seller. And simply put, here's what an agreement for deed is, or a contract for deed. And I apologize, I'm going to use those interchangeably, but not land installment contract. We just don't use that term in Florida. This is an agreement between a buyer and a seller excuse me, whereby the buyer goes into possession of property immediately, starts making payments to a seller, and after the buyer has made the very last payment, has paid off the entire purchase price, usually with interest, with a monthly payment schedule, at the back end the seller gives a deed. understand how different that is from the concept we talked about in a regular sale co contract. We talk about in a regular sale situation, buyer and seller agree right now and let's have a closing in 30 or 60 days and at that closing, title's going to pass from the seller to the buyer and buyer's going to give money to the seller, but the buyer's getting title right now at the time of the closing. Uh, in this contract for deed, buyer doesn't get title until the very back end. Buyer makes payments for 10, 15, or 20 years to a seller. And when he's made the very last payment and the entire purchase price is paid, then at the back end, the seller gives a deed to the buyer. That's yes, similar to, to title theory, right? But I'm saying? It's similar to title theory when the bank holds the title to the very end, but 
southern tip? Well, yeah, if you were trying to analogize it to a mortgage, yes, mm -hmm. it would be like that if, as if the bank held title. It's just that in this case, that happens to be the seller. And the seller had title already. And, and the title theory concept that you're talking about where a lender gets title of the property, the lender wouldn't have had title previously. In this case, the seller had title. The seller already owned this piece of property. Now, why would you do one of these things? Well, probably because as a buyer, you can't get a loan any other way. Basically, you have no credit. You don't have a down payment. Um, really, sometimes there's zero down payment. Sometimes the buyer goes in for zero, just like a car loan where, you know, drive it away, don't make a payment for a month. Um, basically, buyer pays little or nothing down, buyer can't get a loan anywhere else, and frankly, the types of properties we're talking about are not, not very high-end stuff. Sophisticated people don't do deals like these. Um, they are normally low-income housing, uh, low credit, um, um, they're for unsophisticated folks. However, they are used in one additional area. You'll find that all over the state of Florida, places in the center of Florida, Sebring and Lake Wales and <coughs> all kinds of places, where land is for sale, uh, building lots that are advertised to Yankees to come on down and own a piece of Florida, almost all of those deals are done on an agreement for deed. The big benefit to a seller in this situation, we're going to talk about the pros and cons in a minute, but understand the benefit of this to a seller. The seller gets to keep title to this piece of property for the entire term of this contract. For 10, 15, or 20 years, the seller still holds title. The seller can go out and get a mortgage on it. Um, the seller has no risk whatsoever because he always has had title. In our purchase money situation, purchase money mortgage situation, the seller actually deeds the property to the buyer and takes a mortgage back. The seller doesn't have title anymore in a standard purchase money mortgage situation, which is the other form of seller financing. In this form of seller financing, seller gets the whole title all the way through until buyer has made all his payments, so the risk to the seller is eliminated. Now, conversely, since the risk to the seller is eliminated, the risk to the buyer is immense. Think about this. You're, as the buyer, making payments on a piece of property for 20 years, and only at the back end of it does the seller have to sell it to you. What if the seller never really had title? What if he had title and deeds it to somebody else during that 20 years? What if he goes out and gets a big fat mortgage on the property, and when you've made your last payment, there's a $100,000 mortgage on there? The benefit to the seller of holding title to the property the whole period of time is the same detriment to the buyer. The fact that the buyer is making payments, but somebody else has title. So, this is not a good situation for, for a buyer. It's an unsophisticated buyer, really doesn't have a clue about what these issues are. And frankly, maybe doesn't care a hell of a lot because all the buyer's thinking about is, I can get into this piece of property, and all I have to do is make this small payment every month with nothing down. And it really doesn't become a significant issue to a buyer until he's paid a substantial portion of the purchase price, and then he starts thinking about getting title. And then maybe he does a title search, and finds out, oh my god, the seller never even really held title to this damn thing. Because different from our situation in a regular sale transaction, where the buyer examined title before the closing and before he handed over his money. In this case, the buyer just starts making payments. This is called an agreement for deed or a contract for deed. Buyer makes all his payments first, 
gets title at the back end. And, 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 and buyer has no recourse. Buyer can sue the seller, we're going to talk about the remedies, mm -hmm. but there's not an awful lot a judge can do for you if the seller didn't own the piece of property. Or if you want your money back and the seller doesn't have the money anymore, didn't have the property and doesn't have your money to give your money back. So the, the recourse to the buyer is, is pretty minimal. Uh, it, it's not a great situation. Um, understand basically what's in one of these agreements. Uh, just like any sales contract, I mean, we're going to talk about a couple of the, the basic provisions to understand what one of these things look like because this looks like a sales contract. It's four or five pages of provisions. And it is entitled probably sales contract or installment sale contract. It's going to have a purchase price. It's going to say stuff like the buyer can't commit waste to the property. Uh, the buyer can't remove the improvements. Let's, let's think of it in terms of a house where the buyer would maybe going to get to move in and live in the house. So he, he, can't, he can't waste the improvements. He can't remove the improvements. The seller gets to inspect because the seller owns the property. Those provisions are all going to be in there. There's going to be a big, heavy indemnification provision. <coughs> Remember that the seller holds title. And what happens if somebody gets hurt during the term of this contract? Well, the seller is going to certainly want, remember terms we've talked about before, an exculpatory clause that the seller is liable, and indemnification and hold harmless clause where the buyer holds the seller harmless, except these buyers having them hold you harmless is not normally a great financial windfall. Uh, but the point is the seller needs provisions that says that during the term of this agreement where seller holds title but is not in possession, just like in a lease, the seller is not liable if somebody gets hurt. Um, there are provisions about assignment. There are provisions about the seller's ability to still mortgage the property if the seller wants to, but that the buyer can't mortgage the property. That's a given. The buyer doesn't have title. And there are provisions about conveyance. Uh, at the back end, there are provisions that say that once the buyer has made the final payment, then the seller will give them a deed. There are also going to be, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, remedy provisions um, and enforcement provisions um, and, and what people can do, um, both seller and buyer, when the other side defaults. Um, but let's review just for a moment, now that we kind of know what's in there, one more time, the, the advantages and disadvantages to the parties. Um, there is only one advantage to a buyer ever, because these deers were a nightmare for a buyer. The only advantage is affordability. Somebody who could not afford the piece of property and has no credit and nobody down maybe can get into a piece of property this way. It becomes affordable. The advantages of the seller are numerous. Um, seller can attract buyers for perhaps a low-end piece of property because it is saleable with no money down. The reason a seller can accept no money down is because he's keeping title. Uh, so it makes it more saleable. There's an installment tax break for a seller selling under one of these. We're not going to get into that at any length, but it is an attractive tax device for a way for a seller to report a sale. Um, and the seller during the term of this contract has all the benefits of ownership. Um, because he has title. He can go out and fit, you know, get financing if he wants to. The disadvantages to the buyer are the problems that all relate to the fact that the seller has held title. What if the seller dies? Maybe he never had title, or, this, or the buyer has to try to recover title from the seller's estate. Um, at the end of the contract, the seller's unwillingness or inability to transfer good title, either because he had bad title or he had no title at all. And there are risks to the buyer of not recording these things. Now, if you're a buyer, you can protect yourself by recording this installment contract, and that will at least put the world on record that you have an interest in this property. 
but for those same reasons the seller doesn't want it recorded because the seller wants to have free unencumbered title all the way through the term of this contract until he's been paid in full. Um, there really are no disadvantages to the seller whatsoever. Um, everything swings the seller's way. Now, here's the big issue and the Florida wrinkle that I want you to be aware of and it relates to the seller's remedy. Here's what sellers put in these agreements and this is the clause I said we would come back to and it's called forfeiture. Sellers all put in these agreements for deed a provision that says buyer if you ever miss a payment you have forfeited your interest in the property and all of your payments are deemed rent not as payments on the purchase price but all the payments you made previously will now be thought of as rent and you're out you have forfeited whatever equity you may have built up by the payments you made up until the time you defaulted that's a provision called forfeiture now sellers always put those provisions in an agreement for deed that say buyer if you ever miss a payment you forfeit you're out your payments were rent get out of here vacate the property now what you need to know is Florida has a statute that says that that doesn't work. The text mentions that in a majority of states, this forfeiture remedy, this forfeiture provision that we just talked about, is enforceable in most states. It says later on, a minority of states require the seller to do a judicial foreclosure in order to eliminate the buyer's interest. Florida is one of those minority of states. Florida law says that this is a mortgage and is to be treated like a mortgage and must be foreclosed like a mortgage which means that the buyer has equity and that the only way to eliminate one of these things is just like a mortgage foreclosure to bring a judicial proceeding and have the court sell the property. Now, Florida says forfeiture doesn't work. However, unsophisticated buyers have no idea that Florida law says that forfeiture doesn't work. And here's what happens. A seller, a buyer, buyer defaults, a seller writes a letter to a buyer and says, you've defaulted, see paragraph 37 of the agreement. It says that all your payments are rent you forfeited your interest, get out. And a lot of unsophisticated buyers will get that letter and say, okay, <coughs> and get out. In which case, the seller has won. The seller doesn't need to do a judicial foreclosure because the buyer's left. And the seller had title all along, and he still has title now. And he puts it back on the market and he sells it again to somebody else under another land installment contract. So I want you to understand that the document will provide that forfeiture is the seller's remedy. And Florida law says that forfeiture doesn't work. But unsophisticated buyers don't know that, in which case it does work because these unsophisticated buyers will leave, the seller will then have possession, and he already had title. 
that we can start over and do it again. Does that make sense? Can you all follow what I'm saying? And understand, that's why the seller doesn't want this thing recorded. If it's recorded, how's the seller going to get rid of it? Then he has to foreclose. So basically, from a seller standpoint, the seller has had title, had title before he entered into this contract, he had title all during this contract. Nobody ever knows by searching the public records that there ever was a land installment contract, that a buyer did come in for 10 years and make payments and then get a threatening forfeiture letter and leave. Nobody will ever know. So sellers get away with enforcing in Florida the forfeiture provision, even though our law says they can't, because nobody knows any different, and nobody stops sellers. Um, these are similarly successful against people in other states who have bought <coughs> land in these lots around the state we've talked about. You know, snowbirds who <coughs> always want to own five acres in Florida someday, and sign one of these contracts for $40,000 to make payments for 20 years. And then after a few years, they get tired of it and quit and decide we're not coming to Florida. Their contract was never recorded. Sellers write them a forfeiture letter. Somebody in New, in New Jersey or another state where forfeiture works takes a look at this. Yeah, yeah, contract, uh, contract said I forfeit. I guess I forfeit. Okay, I have nothing. Never mind. And they do nothing about it. And then the seller is able to sell the property to somebody else again. So, seller's remedy of forfeiture uh, by law doesn't work in Florida, but practically it does work in Florida as long as the land installment contract has not been recorded. And that's why sellers fight to make sure that they're not recorded and won't let a buyer record them. Um, and uh, understand that provision in the text that says the small minority of the states require judicial foreclosure. That includes Florida. Um, theoretically, the buyer has some remedies if a seller refuses to give title at the back end. Um, you know, we talked about specific performance under any contract as being the best remedy there is. Your Honor, make him do what he said he'd do. <coughs> but how does Your Honor make him do that if he doesn't have title? If the buyer, at the end of paying for 20 years, and the seller doesn't give title, sues the seller to say, give me a deed to that property, how's the judge going to make him give a deed to the property if the seller never owned it? So specific performance is a wonderful remedy, but it just may not work in this situation if he never had title. Rescission, buyers could ask the court to rescind the contract and make the seller give all the payments back, but the seller probably doesn't have the money anymore. He's probably spent it over the last 20 years. And of course, the buyer could sue for damages, uh, but that's not likely to be effective either. So uh, understand that the buyer's remedies in these situations are very limited. Um, most are not sophisticated enough to go to a lawyer. Um, unless they've made payments for a long, long, long time. And, you know, for example, are 75% pay down, paid down, um, and, and in which case, obviously, they have some equity to pursue. Um, so that's an agreement for deed. That's what a contract for deed is, an agreement for deed. Uh, land installment contract, as they're called elsewhere, but not in Florida, and as they're called in the text. Um, I want you to be just aware of that as a method of financing, um, a method of seller financing, but it's, um, it's not often done. It's not likely that you'll ever encounter it, but you will hear people talk about agreements for deed uh, because it is always a feasible way to go. It's just that it's only going to apply in a situation of a very unsophisticated um, financially and experience-wise buyer. Um, any questions on that? Is that fraudulent misrepresentation? Say again, I'm sorry? Is that fraudulent? Is that fraud? No. No? I don't think it's fraud. Huh? No, it's, uh, um, I don't think a court will hold anybody, will hold the seller liable for fraud. Um, the seller uh, simply has entered into an agreement and can't perform it uh, because they don't have time. I don't think it would be fraud. Okay. I want to talk about mortgage foreclosures. We're out of agreements for deed now. 
although we said they had to be foreclosed. That doesn't happen very often. Let's go back to mortgages, chapter 21, and talk about, I want you to have an understanding of what happens in a mortgage foreclosure proceeding. Um, remember we talked about there are three types of foreclosures of mortgages. Uh, that Florida requires a judicial foreclosure. Um, there was non-judicial foreclosure in a lot of states where the lender simply sells the property or the trustee under a uh, deed of trust sells the property with, with no court intervention. There's strict foreclosure, which is only allowed in one or two states where the lender actually gets title of the property. Um, but most of the states do what Florida does which is require a judicial foreclosure, which means a court proceeding to sell the property in order to recover funds to try to pay the debt. Um, I want to create a little fact scenario here so we can build up a set of facts and what can happen in a default situation and then talk about how would a foreclosure work. Um, based upon this fact situation and see what what conclusions we can draw and what overall um, what overall that means to the position that whoever is foreclosing is in. Um, let's say this is this is you, any one of you. Um, let's say in the year 2000 you're a young, successful real estate broker. Um, you've got a couple of associates working for you. You've got a couple of staff. Uh, and you decide you want to buy a building. Um, you want to buy a 2,000 square foot building. And um, you're going to occupy it as your real estate broker's office. 2,000 square foot office building. So you decided, you go out and you sign a sales contract in the year 2000. You agree to pay $400,000 for this building. And you have, finan you have a financing contingency built into your contract that says that I don't have to close unless I can get a 300, you don't have to close unless you can get a $300,000 new first mortgage. So let's say you sign that contract in, uh, in June of 2000. <coughs> It has a 60-day closing provision. So later in 2000, in August, we're going to have a closing. So uh, during this two-month period under the contract, uh, you go out and locate uh, a new first mortgage commitment um, from a bank that you've got a relationship with. Uh, your neighbor is a vice president, and he gets you a great deal. And he approves your $300,000 loan. He gives you a low interest rate and very low P&I payments with a real long term, a really great favorable loan that obviously you want to keep. So you have a closing. So in August of 2000, you sit down at the table with the seller, and you're the buyer, and the seller's going to give a deed. And you're going to give the seller some money. And the seller happens to own the property next door to your building here. And he wants to reserve an easement. So let's say the seller in that deed reserves an easement to himself for his ability to go across a little portion of your property. Let's say this is you. And the seller's over here, and he wants to reserve an easement. The, 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 the location is not important. The concept is the seller gives you a deed. The seller reserves to himself an easement. You execute a new first mortgage to bank number one. Your next door neighbor buddy has gotten you this great deal. And these are the terms of your loan. And at the time of this closing, the property is worth $400,000. Well, that's cool. Things are going well in your business. You own the property. Uh, values are going up on the property. Just for sake of discussion, two years later, 
a neighbor on the other side comes to you, or let's say this neighbor up here comes to you, and he wants to use an easement too. And he wants to use the same easement across your property because there's a road out here we don't want to get to. Again, the facts are not relevant except that, let's say in 2002, you give an unrecorded easement to a different neighbor. So you've got two easements on the property and one mortgage. You've got a recorded easement back to your seller. You've got an unrecorded easement to a neighbor. And of course, you have a $300,000 first mortgage. So by 2003, things are going well in your business. Uh, the value of the property has gone up to $600,000. And you decide, um, maybe I should go out and get a second mortgage. I could use $150,000 for other purposes. Maybe I want to buy another piece of property. Maybe I want to open another branch office, whatever. I'd like to borrow another $150,000, and I'd like to use my same property as collateral. So you go to a different bank, bank number two, and file an application to borrow $150,000. But because it's a second mortgage, and because second mortgages are riskier, the interest rate is high. It has big payments, but you need the money, so you go ahead and sign it up. So now you have on the property a recorded easement in favor of a seller, an unrecorded easement in favor of a neighbor, and a second mortgage for $150,000. So the property is worth $600,000, but you've got four fifty dollars of debt on there. So that's fine. Still plenty of equity. And things are rocking along, going very well, except at the beginning of 2007, we have the housing crisis. And your business goes down the tubes terribly. All of a sudden, you've got no deals at all. Um, people are leaving your office. Uh, you've lost all your clients. So you stop making payments on the second mortgage because it had big payments. It was expensive. I need to save money, I don't have the income anymore. You don't. But you keep making payments on the first. You keep the first mortgage alive, not only because it has good terms, but he's your next door neighbor at home, and uh, you want to stay on good terms. So you keep making payments on the first, but you stop making payments on the second. You don't pay the two, 2006 real estate taxes, which came due during 2007. But initially, your property was still worth $700,000. But by the end of the year, because we had the mortgage crisis, the housing crisis, the beginning of the recession, all of a sudden, things are really bad. The market value of your property has gone down to $400,000. A former client has sued you and gotten a recorded judgment for $100,000. That person's a judgment creditor with a recorded judgment of $100,000 against you, and you were withholding Social Security and Medicare and withholding taxes from your employees, and you didn't pay it in the IRS, and the IRS filed the tax claim against you. So late 2007, things are really bad. You're hit with a $100,000 recorded judgment, and you're hit with an IRS lien of $50,000. And you've quit making payments on the second. And the 2006 payment taxes are unpaid. And you let the 2007 taxes go unpaid, too. And of course, the value of the property has gone down. Early in 2008, bank number two, because you quit making payments and you have not made them for quite a while, decides to file foreclosure against you to foreclose their second mortgage. They filed foreclosure action to foreclose their $150,000 second mortgage against the property. Okay, that's our factual situation. Um, does that kind of make sense to everybody as to what happened to get to where we are? So let's talk about what happens in the foreclosure. Who sues who? What are the steps? What does the bank do? Who are they going to sue? What recovery are they going to get, etc.? The first step in a mortgage foreclosure will be that bank number two, and that's what we're going to talk about. 
we're going to talk about now what's going to happen in the foreclosure proceeding. The first thing that bank number two is going to do is pursuant to the acceleration clause in their mortgage, they're going to say, okay, we're no longer looking for the big mortgage payments. Bank will accelerate the balance so that the entire $150,000 is due. That's the first thing. No more are they sending you notices saying send me $6,000 a month. They're going to accelerate the balance and say the whole thing is due. The second thing they're going to do, they're going to have their attorney send a demand letter to you. And the attorneys are going to make a demand and say, pay the $150,000, pay attorney's fees, pay late costs, pay default dollar interest, etc or else we're going to file suit for foreclosure. And then they they also stop taking your payments, right? I'm sorry? If you try to pay them, they stop taking your payments. Yeah, they're, they're, they're no longer interested in monthly payments. They have accelerated the balance. They now want $150. you are going to get a demand letter from the bank's lawyers. But most importantly, these are kind of preliminary steps. The most important thing is now the bank is going to file suit. And that's what we're going to talk about. The bank is going to file a complaint any lawsuit begins with a complaint. Complaint is the initial pleading in any lawsuit where the bank will come into court and say, Your Honor, this guy owes us $150,000. He didn't make the payments. Please sell the property and pay us off. Let's talk about who the bank is going to sue, and that's what's important. Who's the complaint against? Well, the first person that they want to sue and that they want to wipe out in this, in, this, or in this foreclosure suit is you, the buyer. As the buyer, you're the owner. You're the one who borrowed $150,000 from them. So the first person they're going to sue is owner, whatever we want to call him, whether we want to call him owner, whether we want to call him <coughs> buyer, well, they want to call on you. You're the one who signed the note mortgage for $150,000, and that's who they're going to sue. That's the first defendant. Who else can they sue? Well, let's look back at who all has interest in this piece of property. They can't sue this seller who has reserved an easement in the property because this whole thing, as you're going to see, turns on who has interest ahead of them and who has interest behind them. They can't sue this guy because he didn't sign their mortgage and he's ahead of them. They were recorded in 2003. Back here in 2000, this seller got an easement, so they can't sue him. But they are, of course, going to sue you, the buyer, the title holder, because you gave them the mortgage and they want to eliminate your interest. You're not going to sue this guy because they don't even know about him because he didn't record. He's eventually going to be wiped out by the case because he doesn't have a recorded interest at all. But they can't wipe out this guy. This guy will be eliminated, but he doesn't need to be sued because he's not in the public records. So who else are they going to sue? Well, it'd be nice if they could sue the government to wipe out the 2006 real estate taxes and the 2007 real estate taxes, even though they came after their mortgage in 2003, but they can't. Why? Because real estate taxes are ahead of everything. Remember we said real estate taxes are the one lien that is in front of everything, every mortgage, so they can't sue to wipe out real estate taxes. The only people that they can sue who recorded and got an interest after them are the judgment creditor, so they're going to sue you, the owner. They're going to sue the second defendant will be the judgment creditor. And the third defendant, who's recorded and has a claim against the property after them, is IRS. 
So the third defendant that they'll sue is IRS. And what they're saying to the court, but they can't do anything about these taxes that are on there. They're going to say to the court, Your Honor, the bank, this is bank number two, Your Honor, these people have an interest in the property. We would like you to eliminate their interest in the property and sell the property. And after depositions and interrogatories and motions and hearings and all the other BS that goes on, ultimately, it's pretty hard to lose a mortgage foreclosure. Ultimately, the court is going to enter a judgment, which is a final judgment of foreclosure. Final judgment of foreclosure. Now, that may be a summary final judgment.